Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is David Quinn. Uh, we're here to talk today about uh, an orthopedic surgeon's perspective on uh, digital this. And there we go. Here's my talk. I hope this complements Dr. Howe's webinar from last week. I'd like to thank GE Healthcare for inviting me to speak, and I'd like to thank especially Caitlin Nye for her role in this. Again, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not a radiologist or an engineer or a physicist. My education and training uh, began in Amherst College, Amherst, Massachusetts, for Duke University in North Carolina and the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And now I find myself here in Albany, New York, 150 miles north of New York City, about halfway between uh, the city and Montreal, Quebec. My goal today is to keep you all uh, reasonably entertained for the next 40 minutes and hopefully uh, you can get something out of um, my experience with this uh, modality. Uh, it's always best to start with terms and terminology so we're on our, uh, on, all on the same page. Digital tomosynthesis, or what I'll call DTS, uh, is a modality that consists of computer-generated images of multiple contiguous slices um, of variably radio-dense objects like the human body. Volume rad is GE's version of it. Uh, tomography has been around for a, a quite a while, actually, and in the old uh, school world, uh, linear tomography or tomograms had m typically multiple acquisitions uh, using a tube and a plate moving in opposite directions and uh, that fixed in on a, a given height. And one would guess at that height and perhaps take multiple acquisitions if depending on how far off one's guess was from what one actually wanted to see. On the other hand, the digital version of, of tomosynthesis involves uh, the computer generated images of multiple slices with one tube sweep acquisition and a stationary uh, digital detector. I am uh, I'd like to consider myself a typical orthopedic or hand surgeon in an atypical single specialty group. Consequently, uh, when we get to the cases um, and the examples of how this is useful, they're really limited to the upper extremity, which really is neither here nor there except to point it out to you. What I also hope to do is show you, give you an opening into the mindset of how orthopedic surgeons think and why that mindset is relevant to this modality. We'll talk about where DTS fits into other tomographic modalities, show you some cases, and then uh, give you my opinion uh, about various things along the way. So these are the drivers of orthopedic surgeons, these MD motivators. Each of us, uh, as orthopedic surgeons, are dedicated to some degree or another, varying from person to person. Uh, and those things you see here, which is first and foremost to provide high quality patient care, to mitigate the risks of, in providing that care, to increase our referrals, to support the academic missions of those institutions with which we may be associated or affiliated, and basically to be uh, more efficient in collections and diminishing expenses, and to make uh, the day's workflow improve. Um, and I believe that DTS can positively impact each uh, and all of these uh, motivators. This is Orthopedic Surgery 101. It's simplistic, but frankly, virtually every patient visit finds uh, an orthopedic surgeon asking these questions internally, typically. Um, does the patient have a problem? Does this problem call for an operation? Was the operation adequately performed? Is the problem resolved? And when the problem is a fracture or other bony abnormality or abnormality involving the joints at either at the either ends of those bones, DTS can help us address those questions. Orthopedic surgeons are 
we like to think they were a different breed. Most people don't like change. Orthopedic surgeons very much don't like change. They don't like shades of gray, which is ironic considering all the shades of gray we deal with with uh, radiologic studies uh, every day. But DTS can help resolve some of those shades of gray into more black and white conclusions about what is going on uh, radiographically. We don't like inaction. We don't like uncertainty. And that sort of goes back to the shades of gray somewhat. And we don't like expense. Uh, this is a general schematic that is applicable to any sort of change. Um, we see that some of us are early adopters, some of us are re resistant laggards, and most of us are the reluctant majority, which is probably an appropriate place to be. Internally, in my group, I would be considered an early adopter, but um, as the power of this modality becomes more evident to my partners through just conversations from day to day regarding cases, um, there is a momentum building towards more broad participation with this modality. So I'll use as a starting place to the story of how uh, I use DTS and my experience with it by presenting a little bit about our practice as a whole and, and the and the context in which I work, and that, that'll, that's relevant to, the, to how the modality gets used. The Bone and Joint Center is where I work. You can see from this picture that it's sometime in early in May. See, there's still a snow pile there in the front, and that's pretty typical for Albany, New York. The <clears throat> Bone and Joint Center is, uh, has Throughout it, it's really an integrated center or organization or even a system that's dedicated to the efficient and effective care of musculoskeletal problems. The Bone and Joint Center, the building itself, is 100,000 square feet. And on the one floor is uh, half a dozen ORs. On one floor of 20,000 square feet uh, is the ability for 12 physicians to see patients. Uh, and then downstairs is a couple of MRIs and that sort of thing. So I guess the bottom line here is there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of interconnected uh, organizations um, that DTS actually can positively impact. So I show this very, I guess, complicated looking slide um, to show what the workflow might be. Here are, here's where the patients uh, come in. Then they have waiting rooms on either side. We have this x-ray area here. We'll get back to that in a second. We have cast room areas here. And then on each side, more or less symmetric, are the areas for six physicians over here and six physicians over here to see patients. Here is our, uh, in our radiology suite, we have four um, plain x-ray rooms, of which one of them is capable of performing uh, tomography. So a patient will come in, and they'll go to maybe go to the doctor area, then maybe go out to the subway, go to the cast room, go back over to x-ray. And we're going to see that expressed in a little bit different way. And this is an expression of the workflow. This slide is just as busy and complicated, but this flow chart, flow chart starts with check-in. And it pretty much says the same thing in a chart form, where Patients get picked up, some go to x-ray, some go to cast room, some go. They're always on the move. And in the course of an hour, when they're actually, something is actually happening uh, for eight minutes or so, or uh, it's certainly a minority of the time that they're there, it's very much of a Disney World experience uh, insofar as the patient is always moving through the system. I, I don't think it's anywhere near as fun as Disney World, but at least it's, it, they're moving. Uh, the organization, the practice has 36 physicians. We see 135,000 patients a year. We take 60,000 plain uh, x-rays uh, in the course of that year over those 135,000 patient visits. And then from, from those visits are generated about, about 14,000 surgical cases. And from a radiologic standpoint, an imaging standpoint, 
The building itself has two, MRI, two MRIs and one CT scanner, but they're not on the third floor. They're down in the basement. Some of the machines are owned by um, or run or managed by other organizations. And from a workflow standpoint, they're not the, it's not so easy to just plug them into that more specialized imaging as opposed to DTS uh, that we're going to, that we will see. So, so plain x-ray is, uh, you know, the old, old style tube, plate, exposure, run it through a developer. Then, at least the way I think of it in very broad terms, 70s brought us what were first called CAT scans and then CT scans, and then uh, through the uh, 80s, we started to have 3D reconstruction of those CT scans. And uh, in before, before plain, sorry, after plain X-ray, but before uh, CT scans, were the old was the old school uh, linear tomography that I referenced in um, my second or third slide. And now we've come uh, sort of back to the future, as I say here, where we have digital tomosynthesis with uh, volume imaging. Uh, computer generated. So let's compare some of the parameters of uh, uh, plain x-ray or in this case now digital x-ray versus CT scanning versus DTS. Um, and we're going to look at radiation dose, we're going to look at effect on workflow, and we're going to look at ROI, return on investment. And we're going to consider that that ROI um, is not so simply defined in an economic basis, but in fact, um, uh, there are other returns on investment that are uh, relevant. This is out of the literature, where and so it's a it's a long uh, quote here out of the literature, but it's the bottom line, where uh, tomosynthesis, even do, done in two planes, that is two an AP and a lateral tomo view had. 25% uh, less, less radiation than five views of this, the part they were examining. And as you see, 28-fold uh, less radiation compared to CT scan. So we translate that because orthopedic surgeons are pretty simple-minded um, in a lot of ways, or at least straightforward. And we, we say that plain X-ray and DTS are about the same radiation dose, and CT scan versus those other uh, modalities is about 25 times a higher dose, which is substantial. This study out of uh, China, 2012, uh, looked at basically looked at the same thing and found that, uh, in line with the, what I just quoted, one and a half percent of the of the uh, radiation dose of CT scan, but in their study it, quote, can meet the requirements for clinical diagnosis. And that's really the bottom line. And this is the, uh, the first time I'll say that DTS really is considered an intermediate study between plain x-ray and CT scan, where one is unable to, to the orthopedic surgeon, be able to resolve a clinical question um, regarding plain radiographs, the DTS, especially considering the marginal radiation dose, um, is, is really a, a, an excellent next step to take um, before going uh, fully to CT scan. This has to do, this slide has to do with the um, workflow of the patient through our uh, practice. So as, as you recall from the geography of the visit, if a physician, uh, if an orthopedic surgeon saw a patient and they needed x-ray, they'd go back over to subweight and they'd sit, and then they'd go into one of those four exam rooms, four radiology rooms, have their plain films and come back. And on average, if the x-ray suite is full out, it takes about six minutes to um, perform that study. So it's done here and now, takes six minutes. Uh, CT scan uh, is most definitely not here, and it's most definitely not now. So it's another step interposed in the workflow towards getting the patient effectively evaluated, uh, diagnosed, and treated. Um, DTS, uh, on the third hand, can be done here and now, and takes a little bit longer than plain films, but not much. We see 11 minutes. Uh, 
So typically in my practice, a patient would go over, get plain films, come back. I'm not completely satisfied that I can resolve the question. I'd send them back over uh, for some tomograms. On occasion, somebody will come in pre-scheduled, so to speak, for the uh, tomograms um, prior to being seen by me. So an x-ray machine costs X amount of money. Um, and these are in very uh, general terms, but you, I think you get the, the scale of it. Um, to, change, to upgrade one of our uh, plain films costs us, as a practice, $15,000. A CT scanner, very round numbers, $1 million. So um, it doesn't, when you're talking about two orders of magnitude, um, one doesn't need to find DTS too useful before there's a substantial um, return on that investment, whether it's clinically or economically for that matter. So I'll just say, say this briefly, that based on our reimbursement on a small sample over a short time frame, our experience has experienced, our facility has experienced a greater ROI on DTS uh, than on CT scan. Uh, this is a, in, in America at least, the, uh, we have specific coding terminology that goes with this, and DTS, I wouldn't say it falls through the cracks, but it, the terminology with respect to the coding on which reimbursement has been based historically is not completely caught up with it. But I would say more importantly, there are other, um, there's, there aren't just economic returns on investment to the practice. There's a return on investment to the workflow, as you saw from the previous slide, where patients don't need to take time out from work, come back a different day. Um, they don't, the, 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 the doctor, the orthopedic surgeon can get his, the answer likely that uh, he or she wants more immediately. Uh, and the patient can be most appropriately treated. So when you talk about the patient's time, the uh, surgeon's time, and in fact, uh, there's a, I would argue there's a return on investment to the healthcare system on a whole, as a whole, when you consider the marginal um, benefit uh, of the information gleaned from DTS in proper circumstances compared to the marginal cost. So what are the, what are the indications? Basic, again, simplistically stated, stated, we're trying to resolve questions about the bones and the adjacent joints. Uh, in place of MRI, which is typically more uh, soft tissue based, but there's obviously very specific, more broad applications of MRI. But generally when we're talking about uh, the bones and the, and the hard tissue portion of the adjacent joints, uh, plain x-ray and, and CT scan are the workhorses. And at the bottom line there, we want to cost-effectively resolve bone and joint questions here and now with minimal additional radiation and minimal effect on clinical workflow. And that's what I believe DTS can do, and it's, I believe it's worth repeating. DTS will, in my opinion, cost-effectively resolve bone and joint questions here and now with minimal additional radiation and minimal effect on clinical workflow. Um, from a practical standpoint, and again, moderately simplistically stated, DTS will answer or at least address some of these basic questions about fracture care especially. Is there a fracture? How displaced is the fracture? Does the fracture involve a joint surface? Is the joint surface stepped off? With closed or operative treatment, has there been satisfactory restoration of alignment? Is the fracture healed? In other words, what's the personality of the fracture? So we're going to use this as a, leaping off, as a leaping off point to some clinical cases, and which are always more fun than didactics anyway. Um, and I'll say first and foremost, these cases come from my experience over 17 months. Um, we, we pulled up 122 cases from which we gleaned the next uh, several. 
And based on the number of plane films I ordered and the number of DTS studies I ordered, the ratio is about 20 to 1. So in other words, for every uh, 20 plane films I ordered, I found DTS to be useful uh, enough to order it uh, one time. So it seemed only 5% of the time did I supplement plain films uh, with DTS. On the other hand, at first glance, that's a small number, but in fact, it's it's a large number. When you go back to the numbers of, uh, by the by the numbers that slide, you'll recall that our practice does 60,000 plain film studies a year. So that translates to, in our practice alone, potentially 3, 000, roughly 3,000 studies uh, in the organization as a whole. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to it in the future, uh, why I think that is going to only increase. So here's a case. And what I'm, I'm going to try to do is show, tell a story, uh, present the case very briefly, and then show you some video that are a series of these slices, just like the old style movies where you see you know, you have the pictures on the cards, and you flip the cards, and it turns into a movie. So we'll see the movie, and then we'll take one of the slices, one of those cards that's most relevant uh, to the case, and show you uh, that screen grab, so to speak. So this uh, this case involves an adolescent female who uh, showed up with her parents one day, having actually been in a couple of different institutions, uh, urgent care, or ER, and other orthopedic surgeon's office. Uh, with complaints of pain and swelling and dysfunction around the medial aspect of her, one of her clavicles after a fall from a horse. And she was having a lot more trouble than anybody thought she should have since her plain films were negative. Um, and she was concerned about when she could get back on the horse and what exactly was going on. And her parents were concerned as well. So here are her plain films, and she was roughly... Uh, painful in this area, but her plain films look normal to me and everybody else who'd seen her plain films beforehand. So this is, our attention is drawn to this area where my pointer is. I'm going to run it again. These are a series of the TOMOs, or I should say DTS studies. And then here's a screen grab, and we see here a fracture line right here. Okay. So this allowed us to answer her question, answer our question, answer her parents' questions uh, without getting a CT scan. Not that we necessarily would have. So to go back to the questions that we talked about resolving, is there a fracture? How displaced is the fracture? Here's a, um, a relevant study. This was a relatively young person who had fallen on his outstretched uh, extremity and sustained a fracture through his radial styloid right here. Now, intraarticular fractures of the distal radius um, are known to do more poorly if there is a step off of two millimeters, um, and some would argue even, even less than that. But let's just say if there's a step off of two millimeters. And after, uh, after looking at this study, he's in a cast, but it looks like it's borderline. So here's the tomogra tomography. Draw your attention to that locale. Let's run it again. OK. So here's a screen grab. And we can clearly see that this radial styloid is displaced a couple of millimeters or more. So with that in mind, uh, we restored the joint surface and put some internal fixation in there uh, to get them moving early and, and mitigate the risk of uh, degenerative arthritis down the road. Here's a case uh, answering how displaced is this fracture? How displaced is this fifth metacarpal fracture? This is uh, the typical 18 or 20 year old male who punched a hard object with a closed fist and sustained this fracture at the base of his fifth metacarpal. It's intraarticular. It appears mildly displaced on this view. And the question was, how displaced is this fracture, and does it, uh, would it indicate surgical treatment? As we look at the tomography, see it. Let's do it one more time. 
All right. Let's go to the screen grab. And here we see there's actually a fairly substantial step off in this intraarticular fracture. And on the lateral, we could see that it was uh, more dorsally subluxated than we thought. And he ended up uh, coming to surgical treatment. Another question we ask, is the fracture healed? So we've seen, is there a fracture? How displaced is the fracture? Does it involve a joint surface? Is it stepped off? And now we're down to, is the fracture healed? Uh, this is a patient who had closed treatment of this distal radius fracture. This was an older person, I believe. And in point of fact, in the, in the course of this fracture healing, it had settled somewhat. If we think of it as having rotated a little this way, counterclockwise as you, as you look at it. Um, and it had been in a cast, and it came out. It still had some swelling and tenderness, but the fracture really looked um, more looked like it was healed, notwithstanding that it was not in perfect position. But enough time had gone by that it was thought that it, we should be able to get this person moving. So before doing so, however, we obtained this tomography. Looking at this site right here. And with this screen grab, we see that uh, quite clearly it's not yet healed. So we put this patient in a, back in a cast for another uh, few weeks, and it went on to heal uneventfully. Um, linear tomography, linear tomography that is TOMOS, back in the day, as they say, probably had most of its orthopedic application, at least in the upper extremity, with scaphoid fractures. Scaphoid fractures are, are, are real bare. They, they are prone to, to not healing even in a completely non-displaced, uh, when they have a completely non-displaced uh, pattern of presentation. Uh, and because if they're missed and they don't heal, they go on to a very predictable pattern of degenerative arthritis, it's very important not to miss these. So uh, we're quite paranoid about scaphoid fractures, when they're healed, when to, when they're, when to let people start moving and that sort of thing. So this question is, is the scaphoid fracture healed? This is a, going to be a, a male on the, around the age of 20 to 25. And here's a scaphoid, a midway scaphoid fracture, completely non-displaced and apparently healed. But he wanted to get back to football or lacrosse or some version of a contact sport. And although he was eager to do so, I was relatively um, cautious about letting him until I was absolutely certain that this had healed sufficiently. So we obtained, oh, sorry, we obtained this study looking at this fracture line. Okay, and in the next slide, we have a screen grab from that study, and we see that at least on this view, about half the fracture line is uh, still quite evident. And so based on this study, I elected to keep him out of um, his contact sport uh, for, for some further period of time until I was uh, more convinced that he was uh, asymptomatic enough to let him do so. In the context of the scaphoid fractures, we take a look at the uh, literature. And this is an interesting study from 2010 out of Sweden where 35 patients came in. They had uh, signs and symptoms consistent with a scaphoid fracture. Maybe they had the right story. They were 20-year-old male, hyperextension injury, swelling and pain in the snuff box of the wrist over on the radial side of the wrist. And yet, plain radiographs that were uh, negative for a fracture. So they took, the, they took these 35 patients, brought them back two weeks later to uh, repeat the radiographs. And in those three patients, uh, sorry, in those 35 patients, Three of them uh, had what would now be understood to have been occult fractures that only became evident at two weeks. And they took plain films and uh, DTS studies, and only one of those three patients um, <clears throat> had a fracture evident on uh, plain films. That is, two of the three patients uh, required DTS to make the diagnosis at two weeks. So that's not to say it wouldn't have, couldn't have been made on plain films at three weeks or four weeks, but at two weeks. Here is a, uh, so we talked about 
scaphoids not healing. Here's here's a case that involved uh, a patient who had had a um, ulnar styloid fracture, um, older patient, and ulnar, you see this ulnar styloid fracture, which is frequently in conjunction with a distal radius fracture. That, uh, but I don't recall that this was. But in any event, this patient had an ulnar styloid fracture and persistent complaints referable to it. Now, we always say that ulnar styloid fracture non-unions are, quote, never a problem, unquote. But in point of fact, sometimes they are symptomatic. And the question was, was the source of his per, um, persistent ulnar wrist pain the non-union or something else? So we obtained a look to see how healed this was, if at all. And our attention is drawn to that fracture line. And we can take from, see from this screen grab that the fracture line is quite evident. It's a full-on non-union. There's some degenerative cysts adjacent to that. And when we took out this, that non-union fracture fragment, uh, his symptoms resolved. So let's look at some other applications. Well, it's a little more, some more strange applications, I would say, in my practice. Here's a patient who had volar wrist pain of uncertain source. Um, no real injury, uh, nothing on plain radiographs, diffuse tenderness over the volar uh, radiocarpal joint. And we obtained this study. And I want to draw your attention. It's hard to see, but we'll try to point it out to you again. And here's a screen grab. And what we see here is a big intraosseous cyst in the uh, uh, volar proximal lunate uh, that could arguably be um, related to her complaints since nothing else came up. And we could at least discuss the possibility of uh, bone grafting as a surgical option should her symptoms uh, persist. This, kid, this was a patient who had radial sided wrist and base of the thumb pain roughly over here. But plain radiographs had showed minor degenerative change at the carpometacarpal joint and at the scaphotrapezial joint, maybe even mild, mild to moderate, but symptoms well out of proportion to what the radiographs look like. And so in, in an effort to further examine those complaints, I obtained a DTS study focused on this. And as we can see, there's some bony erosions right here that could be um, consistent with an inflammatory um, synovitis, inflammatory arthritis. And I use this case um, to, to point out that the I find that DTS really um, increases the power of the re retrospectoscope, if I can say it, increases the power of the retrospectoscope. So once I see this, yes, I guess one could say this is here on the plane films, but frankly, it becomes far more obvious as a, as a source of this patient's ongoing complaints. So we more obviously see the source of the pathology. And I think this is the last case. Is a metacarpal abnormal. This was a patient who had pain at the base of his second metacarpal. Uh, uncertain source. Something looks funky right there. Uh, we obtained a DTS study looking at that at the base of that second metacarpal. Um, Let's jump to the uh, screen grab. And here we see this secondary ossification center right here, uh, where he was clearly tender for one, whatever reason. He had a fibrous union of some sort. Something was giving him trouble. And uh, we took it out, and his pain resolved. So let's change, uh, change gears here a little bit for the last uh, few minutes. Um, who's looking? Who, who, are the, what are the, who are the future proponents of DTS, particularly? Those looking to decrease radiation doses, especially in the pediatric population. And who isn't looking to do that? So that's pretty much everybody. And then the other population that I, I think it could be potentially useful in is the uh, tra trauma patients, especially at these level one centers where they, they come in. And we have experience with this. They come in, and there's their protocols where they get CT scanned uh, not infrequently from stem to stern um, as part of those protocols. And it's possible that. Um, there might be a, a way for DTS to um, reduce some of that. Secondly, sorry, wherever imaging 
is a cost center and not a profit center. Now, this changes the conversation completely because uh, we in the in the United States are not u generally used to uh, imaging being a cost center as opposed to a profit center. But there are new and rapidly growing models for healthcare delivery in the United States, including accountable care organizations. More orthopedic surgeons now are in bundled payment uh, programs where there's a, uh, a set reimbursement for the totality of, of, of care, uh, for an episode of care. And uh, thirdly, uh, primary care physicians are, have, are establishing what are called medical neighborhoods. And those medical neighborhoods are their primary care provider and let's just say a stable of specialists, including orthopedic surgeons, who provide care and whose cost of providing that care is, uh, is measured, monitored, measured, and uh, frankly uh, publicized back to the primary care physicians whose uh, own payments are based on the cost efficient use of the specialists and uh, modalities and other treatments that those specialists may order. Um, here's a couple, here's, I thought I'd put in this article uh, from France in 2012, who, which concluded that the diagnostic value of tomosynthesis is superior to that of standard radiography, but inferior to that of CT. And then another study out of Japan in 2014, tomosynthesis superior to radiography, almost comparable to MRI for bone erosions in patients with RA. I guess uh, I use these two slides in an effort to say that we want to, uh, I see DTS as an intermediate step um, on the par with MRI in some cases for particular problems, but where we're trying to most appropriately uh, use the level of um, imaging modality uh, necessary, consistent with our ability to satisfactorily diagnose and treat a clinical condition. These are some of the questions I ask myself. Does DTS sufficiently affect decision making in clinical care? Or affect decision making in clinical care? Can DTS supplant CT scan enough to be worthwhile? Of those 5% of studies, uh, it's hard for me to uh, make a guess. Uh, probably not all 5% uh, of the plain films where I got DTS would go to CT, but certainly some would. Is more granular imaging always necessary? I, I liken this to, um, is a CT scan necessary if a DTS is sufficient in the same way that a, a uh, high, super high quality a radiologist monitor uh, may not be necessary for the vast majority of uh, orthopedic patients? The challenges, as I see it, are getting orthopedic surgeons or radiologists or hospitals to invest in the technology, uh, especially in the case of radiologists and hospitals. Um, getting clinicians to think of it, breaking the CT scan habit, and, and getting the science to catch up with the anecdotal evidence um, of DTS uh, efficacy. I believe this, few, this will be a successful modality. I think it will, its usefulness will evolve as clinicians' experience evolves. I think there may be pushback from those with an economic stake in CT scan and MRI. And as always, the, the medical community and the community at large awaits clinical research uh, supporting DTS. Um, Lastly, I'd like to uh, say a, a thank you to uh, Albert Ferguson. Dr. Ferguson was my first chief of orthopedics. This is a formal uh, portrait of his hanging up in, uh, I believe, Scaife Hall at the University of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Ferguson had a saying that I think will prove relevant in the, in the DTS discussion, uh, which is, here he is uh, informally, he's chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. And he used to say, science will prove me right. And I believe that uh, with respect to DTS, uh, science will at least largely prove me right. Thank you very much. Um,
I will be happy to address any questions and I'll stop the share right now and s thank you for for uh, attending thank you for spending the time thank you to GE so if uh, Dan or anyone else there if there are any questions um, Let's see. Here we go. I got some incoming questions. Question. How often have you found that DTS is diagnostic and answers your question about the bone and joint versus needing to order additional imaging uh, after the DTS, such as CT? Um, I think it comes in, I think the answer to that comes in two versions. One is that DTS can be confirmatory, uh, where the plain films uh, I'm leaning towards, boy, that that sure, I, I'd like to be able to say with certainty that this thing is, the, that say the ulnar styloid non-union is the problem. I'd like to say with a greater degree of certainty that what I think is going on is going on. The other circumstance is I'm not really sure what's going on. Uh, does it need uh, a CT scan to answer that question, or is DTS sufficient? And again, you saw that I only have uh, 122 cases over the past year, or a year and a half, say. And I would say, let me put it this way. I have, on uh, more than one occasion, after obtaining the DTS, gone forward with the CT scan, but that is a, it's a, it's a, it's a significant minority of times. There's a hook of the handmate fracture that I could not quite diagnose, but I was very, very suspicious of based on the DTS. Normal, I couldn't see it on the plane films, but sus very suspicious of it on the DTS, but I got the CT scan um, to confirm it before recommending uh, surgical treatment. Um, behind, besides the hand, uh, here's a second question. Besides the hand, what other anatomical joints or regions do you think that DTS will have promise and why? Well, we saw in the upper limb, we saw it in the, uh, in the, all the way from the medial clavicle. Um, I've used it in the distal phalanx of a finger. Um, I, I, I would be curious to see if it's applicable in the cervical spine. Uh, in the in the trauma situation, um, where patients come in with collars and somebody's obligated to do something radiologically, and I wonder if CT scan perhaps could the number of CT scans perhaps could be um, less if DTS were employed in that. But I I think any extremity that involves joint, I think it could be used from the hip on down. I think it can be used in reconstructive surgery around uh, what's going on around implants, whether it's at the hip and possibly the knee, uh, but I can't really speak to that. Another question. How would you propose that DTS could fit into a hospital outpatient or inpatient setting? Right. Um, I, I believe that there is a substantial um, value added to DTS to be part of the uh, radio, radiology suite in an emergency room. As you can see from the geography of the office visit, um, everybody's moving from point A to point B, or to point C, to point D, to point E, to point F. And Frankly, I think that throughput is a big deal in emergency rooms these days. They're always monitoring it and trying to see who can get in and get out appropriately cared for, but in less time. Um, I think it would be less useful in the inpatient setting, but very useful in that part of the inpatient setting that involves the emergency department. And if there are plain x-ray rooms uh, in an ED, um, I think that uh, you could really improve your throughput and have more certainty about your, what you're sending the patients out with um, and make certain, for example, that, oh, this patient has a scaphoid fracture. We need to make sure this person gets appropriate follow-up, doesn't fall through the cracks, uh, thereby mitigating your risk. Gokun, if, you're, uh, if that's all the questions, let me know, and I'll be happy to say so long. I think that's about it.
Very good. Thank you. Goodbye.